conference within a conference. Uh, it's uh, a very special occasion uh, for me. We have been working very hard in the past few months uh, for this moment. And uh, before I uh, forget, I just want to briefly thank the colleagues and friends who have helped me and help the Jewish Music Research Center to put together this uh, wonderful uh, event. Uh, first and foremost, Nomi Konit Center is here. I don't think any of you now can uh, make anything without Nomi. Nomi has been uh, wonderful since the day she stepped in. Uh, my life changed radically, I mean, professionally. <laughs> and uh, I'm very grateful to you, Nomi, for all this uh, contribution. Uh, to the rest of the uh, staff of the center, uh, to Sari Salis, the administrative director, Sari, the director, Shah. Uh, and like Nomi, Nomi is in charge of this conference, but Sari is in charge that the Jewish Music Research Center keeps alive. And that's not uh, an easy task. Sari, thank you very much. And uh, of course, all the rest of the, of the assistants, uh, I'm afraid to start saying names, so uh, they know some of them are here, and that uh, will be enough. We have uh, four and a half full days of music, musical events. Of course, uh, you are most welcome and invited. Uh, to shop around this marvelous conference and uh, there are other many interesting sections so you don't uh, have to feel obligated uh, to be here all the time but we will love to have you here certainly we want to share with you a lot of wonderful music I am extremely glad to open uh, this panel this panel was the initiative of the three uh, nice brilliant young gentlemen uh, sitting uh, in this table. Uh, it was their idea and of course I blessed the idea and it, I thought it was most proper to start the conference with this panel on the 80th uh, anniversary of Abraham C. Wilson's uh, book Jewish Music in Historical Development. This is an opportunity for us to uh, re-evaluate to re-read, perhaps in some ways, as I already can feel in the presentations, even to rewrite Idelson uh, anew, uh, I will say a few words as a respondent after we finish. So I don't want to take any more time. The presentations are going to be rather short or responsive and shorter, as to allow you uh, a few good minutes of uh, discussions with the uh, panelists and between uh, you in the audience. Uh, our first speaker, Professor James Loeffler from uh, the University of Virginia. It's a very well-known friend of us. Uh, he did some, what in Hebrew we call stash, which I think comes from Russia, uh, in the Jewish Music Research Center when he was a very, very uh, young fellow. He's still very young, but then he was a kid. And uh, since then, we have remained in great uh, friendship with Jim. Uh, uh, Jim has uh, finished uh, his uh, dissertation a few years ago on the uh, uh, Society for Jewish Folk Music in St. Petersburg. And that dissertation expanded, revised, uh, uh, and uh, enriched is going to appear at Yale University Press very soon. So I uh, congratulate Jim on this important book and I invite you to give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, the slightly revised title of my paper is the following. The first Hebrew musician Abraham Tzvi Hilson, an invention of Israeli music. And I'd like to start with a quote. We in the diaspora have had no national Jewish art. The Zionists in Palestine are developing one for us. We have had no national Jewish music. They are creating for us. We've had no national Hebraic literature. They are producing it for us. 
We have had no living national language. They are reviving it for us. In Palestine, Abraham Sweet Eagleson has published a collection of 100 all-Hebrew songs. These songs, with their Hebrew words, Hebrew spirit, and beginnings of Hebrew melody, are being exported from Palestine to Hebraize our young in the diaspora. So wrote the American Zionist David de Sola Poole, Rabbi David de Sola Poole, in 1917. Now, a century later, few would deny the reality or success of Hebrew literature and the Hebrew language as basic expressions of Israeli national identity. But Hebrew music remains a contested category that simultaneously inspires great pride and deep consternation among cultural observers. Today, the very phrase Hebrew song, Shir Ivri or Zemer Ivri, is instantly recognizable as one of the most familiar, quintessentially Israeli of cultural forms. Yet there's little consensus about its Jewish fraternity and national identity. <coughs> Witness the controversy over Naomi Shemer's uh, late life confession about the Basque melody of Jerusalem shows Ahav, or the repeated governmental attempts to create a Hebrew song law, um, or even the way in which the terms Zemer Ivri and Shir Israeli inspire considerable debate among scholars, as most of you know, and laymen alike. In my paper today, I want to argue that the roots of this present-day confusion over Hebrew music can be traced specifically to the man to solo pool identified as its original progenitor, Edelson. At first blush, this may seem a curious choice, as Edelson's impact on Israeli music is far from self-evident. In fact, he represents something of an enigma. On the one hand, his intellectual influence is manifold and obvious in the realms of academic musicology and early Zionist culture, as Professor Sarusi and Holman have shown, and his influence on early Hebrew song composers has been demonstrated um, quite extensively in a fascinating way by Professor Shai Burstein. Edelson's English language monograph, which we commemorate today for all its flaws, is still unsurpassed as a one volume study of Jewish music as a whole. On the other hand, few Israelis would identify Edelson with Israeli culture at all. His name is virtually absent from the ranks of Israeli composers. Even Havan Gila is often considered more of a universal Jewish musical symbol than an emblem of Israeliness. Not to mention the fact, as we'll hear about a little bit later in our session today from Judah, that Edelson himself left Palestine, moved to the U.S., finished his career teaching at the Hebrew Union College, that, at that time not a typically hospitable place for a Zionist culture. What I'm going to argue, however, is the true force of his influence is not in his Hebrew language songs that he did write, or in actually his academic research, but through his very invention of the aesthetic concept of Hebrew music. In fact, as I will discuss, I think it's his aesthetic vision of Hebrew music that represents an underappreciated key to unlocking the larger riddle of Israeli music itself, one that runs from the 1910s down to the present. I'm going to focus on two of his early writings, particularly Sefer HaShirim, the Book of Songs, which is the first major Hebrew shiron published in Israel in 1912, and to which is referred in the opening quote, and referring briefly also to Edelson's uh, thesaurus, Hebraish Orientalish Melodian Shots, through a source of Hebrew Oriental Melodies, or Otsar Mininot Yisrael, published in multiple languages and various places between 1914 and 1933. In basic terms, both of these works define Hebrew music as opposition to the diaspora Jewish musical heritage, ostensibly tainted by two millennia of foreign influence. In this sense, they exemplify the concept of Shunat Galut, the negation of the exile, the Zionist ideological rejection of the diasporic Jewish experience in favor of a new national identity linked to the historic return to the land of Israel. But there the similarities end. Upon closer examination, the two anthologies we're talking about here represent two fundamentally different approaches to Shlilat Galut that echo two competing definitions of Hebrew music. One, a flexible cosmopolitan cultural nationalism, which recognizes and even celebrates Jewish engagement with Western civilization through a Hebrew lens, the other a rigid, essentialist, romantic nationalism that rejects the entire history of the post-70 Jewish diaspora for an idealist vision of ancient Eastern Hebrew purity. In and of themselves, both of these ideas are quite common to early Hebrew culture. Indeed, they represent two distinct poles to which much of Zionist cultural thought as a whole gravitated. However, what's interesting, what I find key to talking about Edelson is the way in which they come together in the mind of one person, and the way they not only interplay, but interplay.